something. Jay had the talent to be somebody. Practice, practice, never reenact this. The simple fact is I'm real good at this. They chased one goal relentlessly. He always knew what he wanted to do, and he always knew that he could do it better than everybody else that was out there. Mm. He struggled. He was going to do whatever was keeping food on his table. He felt getting that street money was his true calling. And setbacks. People didn't get his rhyme flow, didn't get his style. Jay couldn't get a deal. Bottom line, some people are just driven. A Brooklyn hustler's defiant pursuit of superstardom. At that time, it wasn't no strategy, man. It was just straight gorilla pimp. Jay was just like, if you don't want to let me in, I'm going to let myself in. Never before seen images, stories, and revelations from the people who know what really happened. When you see the bad side of the industry, sometimes you're like, I ain't going through that. It was like, maybe I can't do this. You know, maybe I'm not good enough to do this. Because they lived it with him. You ain't living proof of what you could become. That all people from the ghetto do have a chance. Sean was born December the 4th, 1969. We lived with our grandmother in a, a brownstone. We lived at 615 Lexington Avenue. I remember my mother bringing him home. He was 10 pounds. I never saw a baby that big. He was a normal child. Happy go lucky. Jay's my cousin. Our mother's a sister. I didn't have no brother, so he was like my brother. We used to have Sunday dinners together. Oh boy, we would have big dinners. Compared to my house, Jay's house was like freedom. And they had all the music and the parties and everything. Jay always loved music. They had the illest record collection. My mother and father kept crates of music in our house. Earth, Wind & Fire. The Ohio Players. The Whispers. The Temptations. <laughs> Every time my mother would put on Enjoy Yourself by the Jackson 5, he would dance and sing and spin around and just do the Michael Jackson dances. He had us behind him. He was the little ham, and we was his, like, backup singer. We moved in 75. They got an apartment in the Marcy Projects. That was the first time we ever was in a project. We lived in the same building. We lived on the fifth floor. I lived on the third floor. It was just, you know, we was all just regular kids, you know. We would just basically just sit on the bench, play dice or stuff like that. Play basketball in the back. He's one of the best in the hood. Sometimes he was the best. Sometimes it was other kids that beat him. You always want to be number one. You always had to be the best at everything. So he would just come back and challenge them again. My mother always told us to try to do our best in everything or anything that we wanted to do. She always gave us that drive. School was the most important thing to her. He was a very bright kid. Jay was always in the top class. Jay was real good in math. English, too, because he's good with words. Yeah. Yeah. When we was coming yeah. up, it was really the beginning yeah. of, you know, the violence. Every lunch hour, there were four yeah. or five fist fights. That's yeah. when crack came out. That's when it was real bad out there. This is really when the gun started to come into play. I remember once asking the kids, uh, have any of you ever seen a gun? Gun blazing was a regular thing in our project. You know, kids would say they woke up to gunshots. You had to learn how to duck, know where to be at the right time, and just survive. Marcy raised me. And whether right or wrong, streets gave me all I write in this song. Marcy was probably the best schooling that we could have for us dealing with this world that we live in. You had to teach your kids how to survive in there. Parents have close hold on you because they don't want that to happen to you. Jay was the baby. So him and my father did a lot of stuff together. There was times they would just walk. And he would walk behind and go, go ahead, find your way home. He was teaching him how to be a man. My father, he left when um, Jay was 11 years old. That really hurt him, because they had a relationship. They kind of closed down for a minute. He got real quiet. I remember a sadness about Sean Carter. There was a neediness about him. See, my moms could teach us, because we was girls. But with a little boy, it's kind of different. <laughs>
what really drove him to start writing the way he did. Jay started writing down lyrics. It was something that Jay needed to like express, vent about. He was writing it and talking about it. He was getting it out of him, so it made it better. He used to scribble. He couldn't even understand what he was writing. It was like chicken scratch. He would write it down so little that nobody else could actually understand what he was writing, so nobody would take his rhymes. You look at his book, when he go out the room, you're like, what is this, hieroglyphics or something? That's his thing. He would sit at the table, he would write the rhyme, and he'll make a beat up and he'll just say it. And then he, no, that ain't right. And he'll rewrite it until he felt that it was right. He always worked on his flow every day. Just look inside the mirror and just practice his rhyme flow. Like zone out everything and be rhyming to himself, rhyming to himself, hearing music inside his head. Late at night, when everyone was sleeping, you just hear him banging on the table and mumbling. We used to get up and be like, Sean, Everybody is asleep. You ain't ready to go to bed yet? No, no. I gotta get this down. I gotta get this down. Yeah, he would get on the own table with a fork and a spoon or something, and he would be beating away. Then my mother went out and brought him a bebop. At that time, it's like a machine that makes all kinds of sounds, and that that's when we wanted to kill her. <laughs> He listened to Run DMC, Curtis Blow. He was the first one around the projects with a Doug Fresh and Slick Rick tape. And we would listen to that tape all day long. You'll keep hearing him rewinding it and playing it, rewinding it and playing it until he actually knew what that person was saying. And then he's reading a lot. Anything he can get his hand on, he'll read. Like all different dictionaries and everything. He studied dictionaries. It was this dictionary that had all kinds of words that rhyme with each other. His lyrics was crazy. He had so much flow, like he could, he could just kill it, man. This cat Slate from the projects was calling him Jazzy, and then he just dropped other letters and just fit Jay Z. He had a different style of rap. Practice, practice, never reenact this. The simple fact is, I'm real good at this. He was more like a fast tongue rapper, the diggity diggity, the like that type of style. Just take the style, make it a mind, and jiggity 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 jazz. Know what I'm talking about? I'm going too fast. Hands are warning you, white want to get gas. There's only one for 90 miles, and my stops to last. He was rhyming real fast. But you can still understand them. Guys come around like want to rap, blase, but we always go, go get Jay and let Jay rap against them. You always hear about him somewhere in the projects battling somebody or at somebody high school battling them. So come on and see me, bro, rhymes. If you're lucky, I'll let you be me one time. You get with me, boy, Mitch, the Frankenstein. Yeah, boy, stop yanking mine. Ah! Everybody used to look up to Jazz because he was the only guy from around the way that was getting recognition from Ramos. Jazz lived on the other side of the projects from us. I think somebody introduced him and Jay together, and they both was interested in music at the time. I mean, Jay just got together right around, exchanging rhyme styles. Jazz was the older guy. He took Jay under his wing. Jazz was schooling him. Everywhere he went, Jay was by his side. Jazz was one of the first MCs to even have a major deal with a major label. Jay was actually on Jazz's first single. My name is Jazz, I'm a partner, Jay. Jay appeared in the video. And that kind of introduced Jay to the world. Jay bought the sunshine and the seas, the pearls, band, bought the dance skin, beautiful girl. Jay Z came flying down from the ceiling on the rope. Yeah, I'm sure. It's funny, man. Work is so true. Yeah, that was like his first video. Everybody was excited about it because there was somebody that we knew that was making a record that had a video. If that album takes off, then Jay's in the game. But that record didn't do too bad. They tried to promote Jazz, it, you know, this big guy from Marcy. Like Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, when that ain't him. Just let you know how stupid the industry people are. This guy's from the hood. Like the hood hood. That's like taking a tiger and telling the tiger you're a rabbit now. That's what I think Jay had to really sit back and realize, like, whoa, what am I getting myself into? What he's seen with jazz is the bad side of the industry. That taught him to be more aware, and that some record companies are shady. And when you see the bad side of the industry, sometimes you're like, I ain't going through that. And that's when he ain't really want to do it no more. He ain't really want to rap.
Jay's career didn't really take off the way it was supposed to. So, you know, Jay was resourceful. He needed some money. He had to go out and do his thing, you know what I'm saying? Look around you. There's a million guys in the street that was hustling. What ended up happening is he dropped out of high school. It did not make sense to sit in a classroom when you could be making thousands of dollars a day. Like anyone else that's on the project, he wanted to get out. He wanted to get his family out. He was going to do whatever was keeping food on his table. I guess at the time, rap wasn't. Jay did give it up for a minute, but music was always a part of him. His drive was always there. Like, he always knew what he wanted to do, and he always knew that he could do it better than everybody else that was out there. No doubt. He never stopped rapping. He always kept rapping. Jay was looking for a stepping stone to get to what he really wanted to do, which become his own artist and to make music. Jay, like a lot of Brooklyn MCs, really looked up to Kane. The Big Daddy Kane is a legend of the whole hip-hop world. He paved the way for a lot of artists. He came at Jay-Z from about late 89, early 90. And there's this legendary night where he, like, destroyed Kane at this club during this freestyle battle. And that was a big deal. Once he met him, Kane was, like, real enthusiastic about working with Jay-Z. And they recorded, a, a, like, a demo together. And I remember Kane just playing it over and over again, saying, Yo, dude, got a hot voice. I buck wild with style, shit out. I ribbing and running a hundred miles, I'm well in doubt. Big Daddy Kane took him under his wing. Jay-Z was kind of like Kane's protege at one point. And so Kane asked Jay to tour with him. Jay was hype about that. He was real proud. Like, I'm going on tour with Big Daddy. Yeah, he really loved that. So Kane would just bring this guy on. <laughs> at that time, nobody knew who he was. There was no reaction. You know, the crickets. Nobody saying nothing. And then he gets on and I kick a beat. And then the crowd is just like mesmerized by his rhyme. <laughs> Jay was hoping that the experience of performing with Kane would eventually land him a record deal, but people really didn't get what he was trying to do, and didn't get his rhyme flow, and didn't get his, his style. It's frustrating when you want to do something so bad and you can't do it. He was like, maybe I can't do this, you know, maybe I'm not good enough to do this. So he stepped back from the game and went to the streets to get money. Jay a hustler, you know what I'm saying? From the start, you hustle first. But other people around you know your talent. So they're like, yo, you can't quit. Beehive kept getting on his case. Beehive was like, come on, you got the talent, man. You just can't let your talent be wasted. I was like, yo, no way, no one's better than you. He's like, yeah, whatever. You're making money, you can't tell a man, stop doing what you're doing. Beehive and, you know, Clark Kent always telling him that he was basically wasting his time hustling. Clark was on him all the time. Yo, you gotta rhyme, you gotta rhyme. So one day, I just got on the phone with him, and honestly, I begged and I pleaded. Clark Kent was the influence on making him realize that it could really happen. I guess I made him believe it. Or maybe he just knew inside that he always was that good, but he just was like, all right, we'll give it a shot. Goal was to get Jay-Z a deal. I was trying to get him signed up the old-fashioned way, make records and show everybody the records. They had so many songs. He was always a hard worker when it came to music. He would come to my house to do songs. The beat would come on, and he'd just sit around and listen to it 15, 20 minutes, and then he'd be like, come on, let's go. And we'd do a whole song, and I'd be in dumb family. You had the mouthpiece. You had the lyrics. You had the determination. How could you not want to sign that? But Jay couldn't get a deal. Bottom line. That was one of the most hurtful periods in my life going to all of these a &R meetings with this music, with this guy who is unbelievable. And people are going, I don't get it. All he really need was somebody to be all over the record companies, you know, that don't take no for answer kind of individual. And then Clark introduced Jay to Dane. I was like, I'm gonna get my guy Dane the Dash. I'm gonna get him to manage it. Clark told Dane, I got this kid from Brooklyn. That's the best rapper you're gonna ever hear. Clark told me to meet him in Brooklyn. You know, Brooklyn, you thought gold teeth, felines, guns, and thievery. Damon's from Harlem. Harlem is all about floss and flashy. And they looked at us as grimy Brooklyn dudes, so all we want to do is steal and rob. Harlem's always making Steal and rob. Harlem's always making it, Brooklyn's always taking it. But I went to Brooklyn, and I met him, and uh, 
But when I got there, he kind of acted like a Harlem dude. He had Nike Airs on. So from there, kind of like, he's a cool cat. I felt like we were cut from the same cloth. Damon and Jay just clicked. Like, they was two twin brothers in the afterlife or something. You know what I mean? Once Damon and Jay-Z got together, I think it was just a collaboration of ideas and dreams that they both had. Damon was like, yo, if you with it, I'm with it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be behind you 100%. Gratitude. Uh -huh. Damon took over from the business aspect from that point. He used to do, set up all kinds of things for Jay-Z. Yo, this is Jesse Barnes, Underground Rough House. We are in the house. We got my man Jay-Z. And Tyson went slicing through tracks. You're screaming, Jesus Christ is back, and God knows he can rap. Me and Jazz put rhythm on the map, so give him his dab. But me, I just take mine. Give me those, give me this, give me that. We used to just, you know, travel all around the city just battling. Went to the Bronx one gloomy night and battled DMX in the pool hall. And he said some rhyme like, my money dance on the ceiling. Now that to tell. Like, nobody's never really heard it like that before. He was a, a local sensation. Like, people didn't want to be on stage against him. Every time he rapped, it was like something vicious was going to come out of his mouth. You just knew something special was going to happen. I had signed a group called Original Flavor. Original Flavor was me, my partner Tone Hooker, and uh, Chubby Chubb, the DJ. The Original Flavor had a single called Can I Get Open. Can I get open? We went to the studio, Jay came. Damon was like, yo, why don't you put Jay on it? We was like, hell yeah, let's put him on it. Jay's about to show it. Well, can I? It's never a question of how, but when I rip it. That single, it was hot. It did real well. We did a lot of shows off that song. We just go up and down the region, the Carolinas, Boston, everywhere original flavor went, Jay went. Check it out. I was noticing that, you know, the response to him, you know, when he would come out and do his verse, people would go crazy. <laughs> he wasn't even the star of the show, you know what I mean? But he would take the show. We thought original flavor was going to open the door for everybody. We definitely had a vibe in the street, but it didn't really go too far. Atlantic Records, which Original Flavor was on, wasn't really doing what they were supposed to be doing in marketing. Damon was tired of arguing with Atlantic Records about how to promote hip-hop. And after that, they started shopping Jay's demo around. I seen so many record execs from so many different labels come up to Jay and Damon like, yo, we want to sign him. Let's do it. But for some reason, when the paperwork got back to people, it was like, they're trying to shaft us. Like, it was always something. Like, they liked it, but they didn't like it. All the record companies, they really couldn't see the vision. And they'd be putting us on hold and putting us on ice. Dane was crazy hungry. Like, you know, somebody just wanted it, he wanted it bad. He really believed in Jay. He knew the same thing we all knew, that Jay was going to be hot. I think it pushed Jay harder. He's not the type of person that's going to just give up. And Dane got the same personality as Jay. And together, you know, I think they was like, yo, we're going to do it ourselves. Jay was trying to put out his own records, but labels weren't signing them. They was trying to get deals, and the doors get slammed. So after a while, I was like, yo, we can just do this ourselves. If I know how to market, and we make more money, you know what I mean? Let's just press up some vinyl, shoot a bed, and see where it goes. Yeah. Create some energy. Gotta keep it I, can't get with that. I Can't Get With That turns out to be the first record that they put out. Like we shot a video for like $5,000. Our budget came in a paper bag with a bunch of fives and tens rolled up. They shot it. They shot all of that with their own money. So it was a labor of love. Jay did that video in Marcy Projects. He wanted to shoot in Marcy Projects because that's where he was from. That video was crazy. Marcy's pretty rough, you know, so uh, to see that was kind of monumental. We had the whole city bubbling just the city, you know what I mean? It wasn't like they had a set plan. They just had a good work ethic. We were constantly making records. It was like, okay, we got another record. Let's put that out. So then we did vinyl for In My Lifetime. Uh, uh. In My Lifetime, I need to see a whole lot of dough. In My Lifetime was basically a song that was talking about all the street experiences that he went through at that particular time. Getting money, hustling. I'm out here trying to make a meal. My thing is real for real. So we went out to St. Thomas and shot a video. In my lifetime, I need to see a whole lot of stash. I need a whole lot of cash. It was all type of girls, water, yachts. You were in a tropical island. Let me in. Well, 
I'm gonna let myself in. Dane went downtown, him and Jay, to John Street, found the office space, had somebody come paint the hallways up. We thought it was so hot, like marble walls. We would come to work, and I was feeling my executiveness, but it was wild, you know, because we were still kind of rough around the edges. We had roaches in the water cooler, mice running around, no air conditioning. They were clearly rats. You had the dice games in the corner. When you looked in, you just, it was, you couldn't believe work was going on in there. <laughs> we had no furniture. Things that they thought to get for the office were a leather couch and a big screen TV. The things that the people needed to work, like a desk, a computer, uh, you know, those things came like later. None of the bosses, Damon J or Biggs, had ever had jobs. So it was just pretty much hands-on, learning as you go. You would be leaving at like 1 o'clock to go get something to eat, and they were like, where are you going? And they were like, lunch, hello, there's, there's things called lunch breaks people have in real jobs. And they were like, oh, all right. So it was just really crazy and really unprofessional, but still the work got done. Tone Hooker. My partner Tone Hooker thought of that name Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Like, it means everything. We took a white person's name and we, we made it a black person's name. Rockefeller. You know, you think of Rockefeller, you think of prestige, but if you really critique it, it's like Rockefeller, so you mess with us, you may get hurt. We're just gonna carry ourselves like rock stars, because we're the Rockefellers. You look large to be large. That was the whole motto right there from the jump. We had all the Jay-Z jackets on, and we had the biggest limousine, and we got the license plates that say Jay-Z. <laughs> we just did anything to make noise, anything to get some attention. If someone had a show, we would just bum rush the show. <laughs> Jay's just start rhyming, kill it, shut the show down. <laughs> He had a song called Coming of Age when he throws out a stack. It's a stack in the crowd. It's a stack of cheese. After the show, it was nothing but talk. I don't know what this Jay-Z dude is, but he got money. He must throw like $10,000 in the crowd. I mean, money respect money. Jay had the look, he had the jewelry, he had the money, and it didn't look like he was just talking about it. It looked like he was really, really, really living it. <laughs> He was just the picture-perfect hustler's hustler. Like, people saw him and wanted to be him. People saw what he had on, wanted to buy that. People saw what he drank, wanted to drink that. We're drinking Chris Dow, and then all of a sudden, everybody started drinking Chris Dow. People weren't talking about Chris Dow until Jay started doing it. And that's like the Rockefeller lifestyle. You see the logo, you see the record, you see the bottle of champagne. There was nothing acting about it. You know what I'm saying? That was just our lifestyle. Everything was just party, party, party. But at the same time, we was partying, we was promoting Rockefeller. We were all a crew, and we all want the same thing. We all want Jay to blow. He had a lot of songs recorded with that president. It was like the one that everybody liked. He was just like, all right, let me just put this out. Got the city drinking Chris Dow's, we up the feet. Players going broke, trying to keep up with me. We were just trying to get a buzz in the street and doing everything ourselves. At that time, there wasn't no strategy, man. It was just straight guerrilla pimp. You hit all the DJs, you hit all the stores. We had a street team. Everyone with backpacks was going to hand out flyers. Put up the posters. Jay-Z, Dame Dash, Big, selling records out the truck of their car. We had our street team driving the Benz. You just chase the street. You keep letting people know that this guy is it. It's part of the hustle of being an independent, you know, record company. They pushed that record real hard, as hard as they could do it. He was doing everything he could, but he didn't know how to get his records on the radio. It was definitely a time where we need to somehow figure out how we can take this to another level. Jay was like, they won't give my records the, the, the light of day. <laughs> Big Meth from the group home, and I'm asking, no, then again, I'm telling, no, better yet, I'm commanding you to watch Raw Monday, midnight, MTV Base. It's not a game. <laughs> Rockefeller. He had a lot of money. But they, they just didn't have the radio politics. So our next step was like, okay, how can we get their presence on Hot 97? New York's number one station, Hot 97.
Back then, like, getting on Hot 97 was a, it was a hard thing to do unless she was, you know, a very major label. You know, they won't play your joints on Hot 97. It would not, you know what I'm saying? If they won't play your joints on, like, regular radio, you got to go underground. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not really with that mainstream thing. We used to just call Funkmaster Flex and request the records. Flex was with the DJ at that time. He was the man on Hot 97. Herb Gotti. He was like, I'm telling you, Flex, this record is hot. <laughs> The first time I got the record, I played it like eight times in a row. So that was the first time we got on the radio, and we were like, yes, we finally got radio. Then we had a B-side, which changed Jay-Z's career. It was that song's rap, and it broke. It was like a rock. Everybody loved it. In the club, they just made all the DJs play it, play it, play it. The video got into heavy rotations on MTV. It ended up being on the Nutty Professor soundtrack. That's when Jay-Z, national star, was born. Everybody was just waiting for him to do the record. They're like, yo, when you gonna do a record? It was a big expectation for Jay's album. We all did the album at D&D Studios. He was getting producers to do records for absolutely nothing because he was that good. He doesn't write no rhymes down. He listens to the beat and he writes the rhymes in his mind. And Jay hop from room to room and just knock them out. That's where we recorded Brooklyn Final. I was in the studio with Big and I played the beat for Brooklyn's Finest by accident. Big heard the beat and ran approximately 100 feet top speed and said, is that for me? And I was like, nah, I'm sorry, this is for Jay. He goes, yo, man, let me get on that record, right? So I'm like, come with me. Biggie was our hero, you know what I'm saying? You know, being from Brooklyn and all. Jay and Big, they went to school together, so they kind of had a relationship already. So I guess it was just meant to happen. The first time Biggie was there. I remember Jay asked for a pad. He was like, gave it to Biggie, and Biggie was like, What's that for? He was like, So you can write. He was like, Nah, I don't write. He was like, You don't write neither. He was like, Nah. And that's when they found out that both of them didn't write. That day, that was the beginning of everything. That's when him and Big became friends, and it was on from that point on. Jay loved Biggie. You know, I never really seen Jay embrace nobody like that, like no other rapper, like really nobody. They became like real tight because they used to call each other all the time, be around each other, like we did shows together. Them two together wanted to be the number one rappers. They had conversations on, we are going to smash everybody. Biggie was on his ascent and Jay didn't even have a setup. Like no one even knew this record was coming out and then boom. Big is on it. It was crazy. I mean, when the album dropped, everybody had it. I mean, it was selling like high kicks. Every car had it. Every little kid had it. But that's when you saw, like, okay, the world was catching up to him. Let's do it again. People finally said, oh, this is for real. Hey, all right, big man. You want to make some big bucks, huh? It was really like him, his introduction, really explaining who he was, what he'd been through. Reasonable Doubt portrayed a hustler who was getting a lot of money, who was trying to get out the game. Sold it all from crack to OPM. MCs had definitely touched, you know, on hustling, but Jay talks about what it can do to a person's inner peace and what it can do to their mind. It was so simple to believe him, like, because he was that vivid and his picture was painted so perfectly. Everybody thought he was, like, a lyricist of the future. Stopping a deal. Rockefeller was totally focused on winning. That was uh, right up our alley. New York actually offered us the first good deal with the right money. So we ended up at Def Jam. He's not signed to Def Jam as an artist. They have a partnership. And by him just holding on to his own stuff, it definitely gave him more power. Unfortunately, I was doing a time where um, they passed away. It affected them heavy because they was so close. 
you got one of the greatest MCs that's no longer with us, you know? So now it's like, somebody gotta step up. Jay had the pressure of feeling that he had to take over what Big started, or he had to claim that I'm the guy now. People wanted Jay-Z to fill those shoes immediately the second Biggie died. That's why I think it was so gloomy at that time. It was like, Jay, you don't, you don't want to fill those shoes, but it's like he had no choice. That's when he did In My Lifetime, Volume 1, so he wasn't in his greatest spirit. On top of that, we was in a little craze in hip-hop where everything had to be, like, puffy and, you know, wear silver suits. Bad Boy Puff was controlling the airwaves. They were making incredible records, and they were making people dance, and they were making white America say, rap is all right. Jay figured, like, hey, let me just do a record like everybody else is doing. If it works, then they'll hear everything else that I'm trying to bring out. He just wanted to be bigger, and he felt going with Diddy and that whole bad boy sound was going to be bigger. At the time, everybody was making R&B type sounding records with R&B people on the hook. That's why they chose Babyface to do a song. Babyface didn't equate to rap. He equated to smooth R&B. And then Hype Williams did the video. His sunshine video. It was just colorful. Yeah, we were like wearing suits and some clownness and circus, but you know, his name is Hype, so he hyped us up to do it. He put the fish lens on Jay. And, yeah, Jay looking like Joe the Camel, man. <laughs> not a good look. <laughs> that was not good. Oh, that wasn't good. That yeah, wasn't good. It was too, too bad with that album that he had a shot for the crown. After the Sunshine video, Jay-Z needed to change that image really fast. In My Lifetime, Volume 1 was actually a very good album, but people wanted more from Jay-Z. He was like, okay, no problem. Streets is watching. Streets is watching. So Streets is watching was going to be a series of videos, almost like a video album. Two commercials. Jay hated that that video was being played so much. He didn't want people to think that I'm this crossover pop selling out rapper. It just didn't hit the expectation. Not me. It wasn't us. <laughs> when I saw volume one, definitely kept Jay out there as one of the best lyricists, but people in the street kind of took it as more of a commercial attempt. I've been in I remember a kid in the street saying to me, oh man, he got to come better than that, you know, Biggie's not here. It grounded him, definitely, because he was riding an untouchable wave with reasonable doubt. It's like when he came out with Vine, they was like, oh, maybe you ain't that ill. I didn't think with that album that he had a shot for the crown. After the Sunshine video, Jay-Z needed to change that image really fast. In My Lifetime, Volume 1 was actually a very good album, but people wanted more from Jay-Z. He was like, okay, no problem. Streets is watching. Streets is watching. So Streets is watching was going to be a series of videos, almost like a video album. Uncut, uncensored, straight to the point, Brooklyn, hardcore. Def Jam would not do streets is watching. So me and Jake put up our own money. Just gonna shoot it and keep everything raw and real. Keep it street. Did one video in a strip club. One video hustling in a small town in Jersey somewhere. I remember seeing Jay-Z coming out the hotel and he had the hat cocked to the side. The pictures that you already knew about Jay just came to life for you. That was like ultimate, ultimate hip hop. Totally block out everybody's memory of sunshine. That definitely gave me a sense of his street cred. Once we put our streets in watching, the streets embraced us right back again. People knew, like, hey, he's not that crossover rapper. Everybody wanted to get that streets was watching tape. Everybody watched it. Everybody wanted a copy of it. It was like a ghetto smash. It made them ghetto superstars. After streets was watching, we went on a Puff Daddy tour. And I thought that was like the best thing. I was like, yeah, like y'all going out with Puffy, oh, this is gonna be so big. They had this big production and people were flying and talking about people going to wave and all these suits. And we just got on there with our bulletproof vest. We did like a small set and just kept it real gutter. We printed up these jackets. I guess we felt like rock stars. 
but a lot of things was going on. But people wanted more from Jay-Z. He was like, okay, no problem. Streets is watching. Streets is watching. So Streets is watching was going to be a series of videos, almost like a video album. Uncut, uncensored, straight to the point, Brooklyn, hardcore. Def Jam would not do Streets is watching. So me and Jay put up our own money. Just going to shoot it and keep everything raw and real. Keep it street. Did one video in a strip club, one video hustling in a small town in Jersey somewhere. I remember seeing Jay-Z coming out the hotel and he had the hat cocked to the side. The pictures that you already knew about Jay just came to life for you. That was like ultimate, ultimate hip-hop. Totally black out everybody's memory of sunshine. That definitely gave me a sense of his street cred. Once we put our streets in watching, the streets embraced us right back again. People knew, like, hey, he's not that crossover rapper. Everybody wanted to get that Streets was watching tape. Everybody watched it. Everybody wanted a copy of it. It was like a ghetto smash. It made them ghetto superstars. After Streets was watching, we went on a Puff Daddy tour. And I thought that was like the best thing. I was like, yeah, like y'all going out with Puffy? Oh, this is going to be so big. They had this big production and people were flying and talking about people in a wave and all these suits. And we just got on there with our bulletproof vest and did like a small set and just kept it real gutter. We printed up these jackets. I guess we felt like rock stars. But a lot of things was going bad on the tour. Sometimes we have dressing rooms, like in bathrooms. They'd be split in half, like, you know, usher one side, us on the other side. We were like trying to fight to get extra bag of Doritos in our dressing room. They were shortening our time. We would come out, you know, the venue wouldn't be filled. It's like, yo, why are we here? <laughs> Halfway through the tour, Jay just like left the tour. We got to New York, I was like, I'm done. But while we were on the tour, we heard the beat for Hard Knock Life. Pink Capri was DJing, the kid was opening up for the Puff Daddy tour. He played Hard Knock Life at the beginning of all the shows. It was so catchy, everybody was jamming to it. I was like, oh, and Jay was like, oh. Baby. So I went and called 45 King. I was like, I'll give you 10,000 cash tomorrow for that beat. Uh-huh. I got him that money. You know what I mean? We got him that money. Uh-huh. I brought the tape to the studio. He laid down the vocals one time. He did it one take. We knew. He laid the rhyme, he was like, it's a rap. I'm from the school of the hard knocks. It appealed to everybody, like to the suburbs, to the streets. Even though it was any, it just felt like a street uh -huh. anthem. It was this popcorn-y thing, but it personified what we go through in the hood. Instead of kissing, please. But that's it. That's Marcy. That's the hood. That's us. All of a sudden, that, that record hit the streets, and boom, that thing just skyrocketed. He had that same vibe with that whole album. And I was like, you know, we got four records that are hot. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Money ain't a thing. Money ain't a thing. Hard knock life. <laughs> Can I get it? All those records led up to the Hard Knock Life album. Jay came out number one, stood number one for like five weeks. It sold over five million albums. You never think you'll sell 500,000, never think you'll sell 100,000. And let alone sell five million records, that's like unbelievable. Hard Knock Life was a turning point in terms of people knowing about him. That's when the audience changed from all do-rags and, and blunt smokers and, you know, drug dealers. White America went and bought it. Hard Knock Life wins him the Grammy, wins him the MTV Award. Jay-Z featuring Jowell It wasn't like any type of hip-hop he was hearing at the time. It's like the world just opened up to him. Jay-Z Jay and Biggs sit down and talk, we need, we need to do our own tour. And at that time, it was very hard to do a tour with that much hardcore rap. So many people had said that 
or it's never going to work. It was the first tour of its kind, all hip-hop, headliners, there was no r and I was like, if we're going to go out, we're going to go out, you know, stake some kind of precedent for the culture and open some doors. Yeah! 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 You know, stake some kind of precedent for the culture and open some doors. Yeah, 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 everybody, yeah. yeah. Throw your hands up in the air, come on. If we ain't gonna like it, just don't care, come on. We're going out every night, and I mean, the arena is packed. I was just amazed. I actually see people screaming, girls fainting, and I love you, JV, I love you. And I'm just looking at them, and I'm like, wow. He makes people feel good. Like, and that was amazing to me. Hey, I would be for real. Is that what I'm really saying? Us is our metal, dealt with the ring. If the choice say to be for slap with a text. He put on a bigger tour than Puff did. It was unprecedented. There was no incident of violence. We sold out almost every show. Oh, yeah! So that alone opened eyes and opened doors for a lot of other hardcore hip-hop artists. He said it could never happen. Too much happening. What's the last show that I heard? You're coming out tonight. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me. I appreciate that. Jay and Dan and Biggs really changed the game. They set a different standard in hip hop. We always just knocked down doors for the culture and community. We did the tour ourselves. We put together the company ourselves. We did rockwear ourselves. That's the anthem. Get your damn hands up. Jay living proof of what you could become. That all people from the ghetto do have a chance. The main lesson is not to give up. Don't give up. What you wish for may come true. I do this for my culture to let them know what it look like when it when a roaster. Jay-Z will never be the number 10 or 11 rapper. He will never allow himself to fall home to the bottom of the pot. This is in his blood. He cannot lose. He cannot lose. Anything he does, he wants to be number one in. It's not like I think I'm number one and I'll try to pretend I'm number one. It's I am number one.